Hey, so uh, this is a solo episode, which means it's just me. Um, I have some fun things to talk about, but before we get to those, let's talk about what's happening in the Dialogue Doctor world. Uh, first off, if you aren't getting the free weekly newsletter that comes out Tuesday or Wednesday, depending on the type of week I'm having, uh, go to dialoguedoctor.com, click on the learning button, and you'll be able to subscribe to the newsletter there. Uh, it is an expansion of the podcast each week. I um, try to take something that was talked about in the podcast and uh, just write about it for you know 500 to 1,000 words just to give you some tips and tricks in writing dialogue uh, based on what we talked about in the podcast. Make, try to make things a little more practical. That's the goal of the newsletter anyway. Uh, so you can just uh, subscribe to that at dialoguedoctor.com if you're not already a part of it. While you're there, think about joining the Dialoguers. That is our... Uh, um, behind paywall community. It is uh, a lot of fun today. The dialoguers uh, actually got on an hour and a half phone call with me, four of them did, and we just hung out and talked about what it means to be a writer. And, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a really great conversation. So uh, I love being part of the community. It's my favorite thing about doing this. So um, if you're not a part of it, we'd love to have you be a part of it. Go sign up for it. It's, uh, it's great. Uh, you can also do that at dialoguedoctor.com. Click the community button, or you can go to patreon.com backslash Jeff Elkins, and you can sign up for the different levels of community there. Uh, okay, that's enough about what's happening in the Dialogue Doctor world. Um, just to give you an update, uh, if you listen to the podcast or watch the YouTube video last week, Actually, if you watched the YouTube video, you wouldn't have seen it. But if you listened to the podcast last week, the intro and the outro that are recorded for the podcast, I was very sick. Uh, and so I just want to give everybody kind of a like, hey, I'm okay. I survived. Uh, it turns out I did have COVID. Uh, I had tested uh, Saturday morning and Sunday morning. And I didn't have COVID. I, I tested negative both of those times. But then uh, I was still sick Monday morning and we were getting our kids ready for school and my wife was getting ready to go into work uh, and she was like, you know what? I should test real quick. So she, we had a, we were, you know, extremely privileged to have an abundance of tests in our house. So she tested and she was positive and then I tested and I was positive and we tested all the children. They were all positive. So, um, and it's been a tough week here. Uh, we locked ourselves in the house for a week um, in order to, uh, not infect anyone else. Uh, none of us had any contact with anybody except those of us in the home. Uh, thankfully, all of my, my five children were all asymptomatic. Uh, and uh, my wife and I were the only ones with symptoms. My symptoms were pretty bad. Um, it started off for me like violent food poisoning and then uh, became um, really intense uh, lethargy with a fever and a pretty severe head cold is what it felt like. Uh, and I did experience COVID brain fog, which was a weird thing. Um, I would say I didn't really start to turn around until Tuesday night. Uh, Wednesday, I was at like 40% of myself. Um, I am feeling good today. So I'm recording this on Sunday night uh, and I'm feeling good now. So for me, the whole journey was uh, about eight days. Uh, and again, I am, I am so incredibly thankful for modern medicine. Um, you know, I don't know what this bout of COVID would have been like for me if uh, I hadn't been vaccinated. Um, yeah, I don't, I, uh, I've had a lot of friends suffer in some pretty great ways because of COVID. Uh, and I am, I am incredibly thankful that my family made it out of this uh, round with COVID uh, without any lasting ramifications. So it felt good uh, to uh, be past it. And be through it. We're all uh, testing negative now. Um, and today was the first day in our isolation based on the CDC rules that we were allowed to like be around other people. So we went to the pool. It was a lot of fun. Um, anyway, let's get into the actual content. Uh, it is a holiday weekend. So we have an extra day, uh, which means I had some spare time on my hands. Um, and when you give me spare time on my hands, I do ridiculous things. Uh, so, <laughs> so I put together a presentation for today's episode just for fun. 
Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm going to share my screen. You can see it. If you're part of the Dialogger community, you will get these slides that I made in, um, in uh, the Slack and, uh, and through via the email. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I had uh, probably too much fun um, investigating different laws of physics this week, because why not? Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to translate those laws. We're going to take a law of physics, and then we're going to translate it into a law of storytelling. And then I'm going to tell you why that law of storytelling matters. <laughs> so we're going to take a law of physics, we're going to transmogrify it into a law of storytelling, and then I'm going to tell you why you should care about that law of storytelling. I, this is like half serious for me. These are just some things that I wanted to talk about. And as I was writing them down, I was like, oh, these kind of feel like laws of physics. Uh, so we're just going to do it in this fun way, this fun and incredibly nerdy, incredibly nerdy way. Uh, I do have a, a slight disclaimer. Uh, I was pre-med in college, which means I was taking my pre road of course, that's to try to go to medical school, um, went to seminary instead. Long story, we're not going to get into that. All I want to say is that uh, I love my science courses, like genetics, whew, that was great. Organic chemistry was amazing. Uh, anatomy and physiology is great. I also love my math courses, like, you know, calculus two, calculus three, it was all awesome. Uh, I hated physics. <laughs> I was, physics and I were not friends. I did not enjoy physics. I did not do great in physics. So the fact that I'm using physics to talk about storytelling to me is a little comical. Uh, but I, I digress. Let's get into uh, looking at story telling with the seven with seven laws of physics. Not these. There's lots of laws of physics. Not these seven laws. But seven laws of physics. We're gonna start off with Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, which is broken into two principles. The first principle being the principle of relativity that says that the laws of physics are the same for all inertial reference frames. Uh, I'm not gonna explain that in detail. I'm just gonna say that what that means is that the laws of physics apply everywhere. Uh, so we're gonna translate that into the principle of storytelling, which I'm going to call the principle of emotional relativity, which means the laws of the emotional journey that we're going to go through today, all of these laws of storytelling we're gonna go through today, apply to all writing. So what does that mean? <laughs> that means it doesn't matter what genre you write in. You have to pay attention to the emotional journey of your story. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you write in uh, crime thrillers, if you're writing detective novels, it doesn't matter if you're writing romance, it doesn't matter if you're writing urban fantasy, it doesn't matter. You have to pay attention to the emotional journey of your story. And I will go so far as to say that the, re the reason readers are drawn to specific genres is because those genres have common emotional journeys. And what the readers are actually drawn to are those emotional journeys. Your story is an emotional journey. That's what it is that you and the reader, that you are taking the reader on. You have crafted this journey for the reader to go on and it's gonna have emotional swings, ups and downs and pits and valleys and really you know great heights and climaxes it's going to be great and the readers are going with you in this story for that emotional experience that's what they want now they may not say that but that's what we crave that's why we love story because we love the emotional journey of it um and so i i fully believe that when a reader is like oh my gosh i love reading romance they love reading romance because they love that specific emotional journey that comes from the plot devices of that genre uh, or when they're like i love sci-fi it's because they love that specific emotional journey that comes from the plot devices uh, that are common to that genre so these rules that we're about to talk to you about emotional journey it doesn't matter what genre you write in. It doesn't matter um, if you're literary fiction or whatever, these rules apply 
across your genre because they are true of all storytelling. Principle of emotional relativity. Um, yeah, so, and I clearly, I'm not, the principles aren't actually serious. I'm, my goal today, I don't know if I already said this, my goal today is just to help you rethink how you're telling the story. So principle number two, the principle of the consistency of the speed of light. So according to Einstein, light always propagates through a vacuum at a definite velocity, which is independent of the state of motion of the emitting body. What that means is that like unlike other forms of motion, light is not measured differently for observers in different inertial frames of reference. So, you know, for example, if you are traveling on a train uh, and looking at things, it is, the perception is different than if you are standing on the uh, side, not traveling on a train. That is, that is like the crudest definition, but that's what, uh, that's, you know, dumb dumb my dumb dumb version uh so, <laughs> so einstein came up with it looking at a clock on a train anyway uh i'm going to take that principle of the consistency of speed of light and i'm going to change it the principle of the consistency of emotional tone the principle of consistency of emotional tone for storytelling emotional tone is the speed of light meaning that it is the constant by which things are observed the emotional tone is the constant by which things are observed so readers are translating your plot points they are translating your characters they are translating your use of prose and lovely language all in reference to the emotional tone at that moment in the story, because as we're gonna look at in future principles, emotional tone is constantly changing. So at that moment, they are looking at your story through the lens of emotional tone, right? Through how they feel about the story. So what does that mean? Why does that matter? It means that readers are gonna judge whether your story is good by the emotional experience they give them. They are viewing the entire story through emotional tone that they will like or dislike the story based on the emotional experience that story gives them. If it lines up with the emotional experience they expect, they're going to love it. If they're showing up to read a cozy mystery that has a slightly suspenseful yet still fun-loving emotional tone, that's their expectation. Slightly suspenseful but still fun-loving and cozy emotional tone and you murder somebody in chapter two making them feel heavy and dark or somebody in chapter four is weeping because of the kidnapping and all of a sudden the reader feels sad they're going to be angry <laughs> at your story because they are judging your story by the emotional experience they are expecting from it i think this is why readers definitely judge a book by the cover because they look at the cover and the cover gives them a specific emotional tone the cover is like this is going to be intense or the cover is like this is a mystery about cupcakes and if they open the book expecting a mystery about cupcakes and they find out the cupcakes are made of human body parts and it's a novel about hunting a cannibal serial killer who makes people into cupcakes they are going to be angry <laughs> they're not going to finish that book because and i'm going to go back to the main point the reader is judging your work on the emotional tone now here's the good news of all of that readers will forgive and i have seen this not just in my own work, but in the work of other people. Readers will forgive grammar, editor, ed, uh, grammar errors. They will forgive plot holes. They will forgive nonsensical use of italics. They will forgive weird parentheses. They will forgive writers like Jose Saramago's complete lack of punctuation. They will forgive all of those things if you take them on an emotional journey that they want to go on if you take them on an emotional journey they will forgive all writing sins because that's what they care about 
What they care about is the emotional journey. So if you take them on that emotional journey, they will forgive all the sins. Yet now, these sins can get in the way of your emotional journey. I'm not saying, hey, don't worry, you don't need an editor, just make them feel something. That's not what I'm saying, because if they can't read it because it's so poorly edited, they're not going to enjoy the book. But that being said, readers are going to judge your story on the emotional tone. The emotional tone is the consistency by which all things are viewed. All right, so we've got principle number one. I don't care what genre you're writing. Emotional tone is key. Principle number two. That emotional tone that you're creating a minute by minute through the story, that emotional journey you're taking them on, that's what they're going to judge the whole story by. Principle number three. In physics, this is called the law of inertia. This is one of Newton's laws. If a but you're impressed that I know that, aren't you? Oh, yeah, I know you are. <laughs> it's a holiday weekend. I'm having fun. The law of inertia. If a body is at rest or moving at a constant speed in a straight line, it will remain at rest or keep moving in a straight line at a constant speed unless acted upon by force. So, like, this is when you're like, you put something in a vacuum. I don't know if you've ever seen them do this in a video. They put something in a vacuum and they just like send it in a line and it just keeps going at that at that speed until something in the back until it encounters something. But in a vacuum, there's no like friction, there's no forces around it, so it just keeps moving. Or it's the idea that like an object at rest will stay at rest until acted upon by an outside force. So this also applies to storytelling and the law of emotional inertia. In the same way, an emotional tone will stay as it is until forced to change by an occurrence. Let me say that again. In your story, an emotional tone will stay exactly as it is until it is forced to change by an occurrence so what so what does that mean so that means you need to be moving the emotional tone of your story you need to be thinking about how am i changing the tone moment by moment scene by scene now if you're a pantser and you're like ah plotting no i don't want to plan anything that's fine i'm not telling you to plan anything i'm telling you to be aware as you write a scene that you need to be actively moving the emotional tone that you need to be taking your reader on an emotional journey and that emotion needs to change and it's not going to change unless you do things to change it so when something happens in your story the emotional tone moves right this could be like the introduction of a character into a conversation, or it could be a controversial tone, turn in the story that's unexpected. Uh, characters' expectations may be met that would create, you know, a type of emotional tone, or maybe a character, what a character expects to happen doesn't happen. That creates a different type of emotional tone. But all of these things are happening in your story and they're changing the emotional tone. Part of the reason I'm telling you this is because I want you to think about your scene construction differently. We talk a lot about like, hey, the plot needs to have a conflict. Every scene needs a conflict. Every scene needs choices. Every scene needs consequences, right? Like that's the three-story method plot outline. Or if we're going to use the story grid, we're going to say every scene needs an inciting incident, right? Like whatever your scene construction methodology is, there's this idea that things have to happen and there have to be repercussions in a scene. There has to be some kind of conflict. But what I'm telling you is that what all of those plot devices are saying is that you, every scene, the emotional tone needs to be moving. It cannot be stagnant. The scene cannot start, stay, and end in the same place. It can start and end in the same place as long as it moves as it goes through, but it can't start, stay, and end in the same place. Readers don't want that. They don't want to show up to your story and watch a rock sit. They want to show up to the story and watch somebody push the rock, right? They want to watch that rock move. So as you come to scenes, your story is a collection of scenes, one scene at a time. As you come to scenes, each individual scene, these moments in your story, think about, am I moving the emotional tone? Is, are the emotions in the scene changing? Okay. 
I think I've probably beat that horse <laughs> completely to death. It is it is officially dead. <laughs> the next one, the law of force. The rate of change of the momentum of a body is equal in both magnitude and direction to the force imposed on it. That's the physics law. I was gonna read it again because it's complicated, but we don't actually care about the physics law. They're just the stupid device I'm using today. So we're gonna take that law of force, we're gonna transmogrify it, just like Calvin and Hobbes, into the law of change. The rate of change in an emotional tone is equal in magnitude and direction to the currents that cause that movement. The rate of change in an emotional tone is equal in magnitude and direction to the currents that cause that movement. So what does that mean for you when you write it? First off, you need to understand that emotional change has magnitude and direction. Emotional change has magnitude and direction. Some emotional changes are bigger than others. Some emotional change, and I would argue that with each exchange your characters have, each back and forth between your characters, the emotional change is moving in minute ways, right? It's moving you know, in toward, toward a positive or toward a negative every interaction the reader does not sense those minute changes what the reader senses is the totality of those minute changes in a scene right as the reader reads each exchange between your characters the reader the the emotional tone is moving in minute ways um, if the exchanges feel benign and just like part of the conversation or in dramatic ways, if we've come into moments in which the exchanges are actually causing uh, drama or causing large amounts of change in the story, right? So as those change, the reader isn't observing every minute change. What the reader is observing though is the um, totality of all those changes. So think about it this way. I don't know if you've ever gone on a long walk before, uh, when I go on a long walk, I often, especially if I'm like listening to a podcast or listening to music, or if I'm talking to somebody, oh, if I'm talking to somebody, this is totally true. Uh, I don't notice every step I take. What I notice is that after time, I'm like, wow, we've come a long way. Right? It's the same with driving. I don't notice every rotation of my car's wheel. But I notice after I've driven an hour that I've covered some distance, right? So the emotional change in your story is the same. It has magnitude and direction. Minute emotional changes add up to create this total magnitude of change. So even the small changes that are happening in the story, if the reader doesn't recognize them, the reader is experiencing them. That's all I wanted to say about that. It took me like 10 minutes to say it. And I, I also wanna be clear that it does have direction right, that emotional change uh, is positive or negative. And it's not actually a binary where it's up or down, you know, there's, you, you can go sideways with emotional change because it's, it's not just like, oh, it, this is a good emotion or a bad emotion. We can be sad or happy. We can be intense or um, calm. We can be uh, paranoid or we can be secure, right? Like there are all these different binaries working at the same time. So we're actually, when we're talking, if we were to try to honestly graph out emotional change in your story, we'd need like a 10 dimensional graph where we're like, okay, we moved to the Northwest a little bit this time. Uh, so all of that uh, to say is that like your, uh, the journey that you're taking your reader on as you think about the emotional change in your scenes, recognize that it has magnitude, not every emotional change is equal, and that it has direction, and that the totality of that magnitude and direction is the emotional tone of your overall story. Um, the bigger the occurrence that happens, the bigger the character that enters the scene, the bigger the uh, failure of expectations of a character, the bigger the um, conflict between two characters, the bigger the emotional change. The emotional change is connected to the size of the occurrence in the plot, right? So I say this to say, when I was an early writer, I would do big things in my plot uh, and not recognize that they were causing big emotional changes. 
I would kill a character. I remember in one of my first books, I, I killed an FBI agent. I did it all. I did it kind of like not necessarily off stage, as in like I didn't talk about it, but like my characters were walking away from a car that blew up with an FBI agent in it. Um, and I totally skipped over the emotional processing that in real life would have happened, right? Like one of my characters, their partner blew up in a car down the street. And I was focused on the mystery. So I was, as the writer, I was like, oh, who could have blown up that car? What does that mean? We need to go talk to this person. Let's go get it done. And my characters ran off to like go find the next clue. S missing the fact that this big occurrence had happened. I just killed somebody in the car. <laughs> and that my, my character whose partner had just died needed to process that emotional change that that was a big emotional change in tone and that in real life, it would have been a huge occurrence for my character. Um, and it, sure enough, Amazon reviews started coming in and people were like, he killed an FBI agent in the middle of the book and acted like nothing happened. <laughs> that is the readers telling me, hey, this big thing happened and you didn't deal with it emotionally. You just pretended like it didn't happen. So. The bigger the occurrence, the more you need to deal with it in your story, right? You you have to process those emotional changes. Um, yeah. Next law. The law of action and reaction. When two bodies interact, they apply forces to one another that are equal in mag magnitude and opposite in direction. So this is summarized as that, like for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So I want to turn this into the law of character interaction, the law of character interaction. When characters interact, there's change, both in their relationship with one another and in the emotional tone. So what does that mean? When characters interact, there is a change, both in their relationship with one another and the emotional tone. Your character goes to speak to a barista to order a coffee. I usually, I use this example because I feel like it's a pretty benign conversation. Your, re, your character goes to speak to a barista and order a coffee. Even in that benign exchange, your character and that barista rub against each other. They both bring expectations to the conversation. Your character is going to order the coffee. Your barista is going to take your character's order and get money from your character to pay for that coffee and then make the coffee and give it to your character. There are expectations there. The, the barista is likely expecting your character not to be a jerk about it. Your character is likely expecting the barista to be civil. In, in the interaction, if not, at least show a modicum of customer service, right? The characters come to this even benign interaction with expectations. As those expectations rub against one another, maybe your character is rushed and isn't as civil as the barista expected them to be. Maybe the barista is bored and isn't as uh, engaged as your character wanted them to be. That generates conflict, right? That generates an occurrence that moves the emotional tone. So when characters interact, if their relationship with one another changes as your character's expectations aren't met by the barista, your character begins to feel a certain way with the barista. So your character should start to change in how they're treating the barista. As the barista's expectations aren't met by your character, the barista starts to also change in how they're dealing with your character. So you can see that like characters interacting rub against one another and create conflict that escalates or de-escalates based on how that how that friction is going. So those characters are either going to come closer together when expectations are met, they're going to draw closer together because they're happy that expectations are being met, or when expectations differ or expectations aren't met, it's going to push the characters farther apart, right? Moving that emotional tone in a negative direction based on the character interaction, how big their conflict might be between one another, the emotional tone is bigger. Again, part of this all feels like common sense, right? When you hear it, you're like, yeah, characters fight. <laughs> when characters talk, they either come together or they push apart. But 
my goal is to help you start thinking about your scenes in this way. When I, in this scene, how are these characters interacting? Because I, I promise when you start asking this question about your scene, you're gonna discover that often your characters are having conversations and there is no emotional movement. You're breaking the law of inertia, that there is a, there's something being pushed there's an occurrence happening, an emotional change in your character should be taking place, but it's not because we're so focused on the plot and getting through the moment of the scene or because we're not emotionally engaged with our character as we write them. So we, when your characters rub together, you should be feeling emotional change. Every interaction is a rub. Every interaction is a rub, right? Every interaction between two characters should change their relationship with one another and the emotional tone. We're in this constant flux of how we interact with others and how uh, and the story's emotional tone is in constant flux based on what's going on. So start thinking of the conversations between your characters as a dance or a fight, right? The characters are giving and taking from one another. If they're dancing, they're moving in sync in the complementing ways that uh, you know enhances um, their interaction. If they're fighting, they're moving against each other. One swings, the other ducks. The other swings, that one ducks. Right? Like they're they're pushing up against each other, uh, trying to find a way in, uh, as fighters do. So they have to respond together, right? And that's the key. Your characters need to be responding to one another as they interact, even if that interaction is mundane, right? They gotta be pushing and pulling against each other. Um, so when you come to your scene and you have characters interacting, whether they're side characters or main characters, um, just run the thought experiment, right? After, uh, during this interaction, how does my character feel about the other character? Right during this interaction, our expectations being met. Is this a fight or a dance? Right, what's happening, and how is this interaction changing the emotional tone of my story? If you want a comedy, happy go lucky story, but your characters are always having these sad, depressing interactions with each other, your story is not a comedy, right? Like, so figure out that um, as you think about your scene, figure what the emotional tone you're creating is and how it's changing, and allow. Uh, and if, if we can get strategic with it, we'll start seeing like, oh, my story is a feel good story because I have all of these scenes that allow the, the reader to feel good, right? Okay, next one. I have no, is this going okay? I have no idea how this is going. I don't know if this is going well or not. This is gonna be the least listened to episode of all time. All right. <laughs> Law number six, the law of universal gravitation. An object attracts another object in direct proportion to the combined mass inversely related to the square of the distance between them. So I've, let me help you imagine this. If you picture like a spider web and uh, you got two marbles, it's a really strong spider web, okay? Picture a spider web, you got two marbles. You drop a big marble in the middle of the spider web and the spider web sags. Let's not do a spider web, let's do a trampoline. You got a trampoline. You put a bowling ball in the middle of the trampoline and the trampoline sacks. You take another ball and you spin it around the outside of the bowling ball. So uh, how it spins is in proportion to the mass of the bowling ball in the middle and also the distance between that second ball and the mass, right? Like this is the law of universal gravitation. So I, I, I'm, I can explain that one. So I... I <laughs> I needed to pause and explain it. Okay, so let's turn this into, now that you have that image in your head of a bowling ball on a trampoline and another ball spinning around it, let's change that into the law of storytelling, the law of communicating change. I don't know if you've noticed that these laws are, are, of storytelling are, are cumulative, right? First, I told you the emotional journey uh, doesn't matter per John, it has to happen. And then we talked about you know, what an emotional journey is and how it occurs. And then we talked about characters rubbing against each other. And now we're talking about communicating that emotional change in a moment by moment basis, right? So the impact of an emotional change on the reader is proportional to the magnitude of the emotional change's impact on the character's voices and the space it is given on the page. 
So let me say that again. The impact of an emotional change on the reader, so how the reader feels this emotional change is proportional, which means is a combination of the magnitude of the emotional change's impact on a character's voice, how you modulate a character's voice, and the space you give it on the page. So what? So if you want to land a big emotional change, if you want the reader to feel something, whether it's to feel laughter and joy, or whether it's to feel sadness and pain, or whether it's to feel fear, you need to give it more space on the page and you need to modulate your character's voices, meaning your characters need to sound different than they usually do based on the emotional state they're in. So if your character, if you want your reader to feel scared, then your vehicle character, the character your reader is on this journey with, your vehicle character's voice needs to start sounding scared. If you want your reader to feel scared, then your character's voice needs to sound like your character is scared. And if you want your, care, your reader to be super scared, your character needs to sound scared for more lines than you think they do. This is always true. Whenever I work with a writer, the emotional moment that you want to land needs more lines than you think it does. The characters need more exchanges than you initially think they need because the amount of space you give it on the page increases the reader's interaction with that emotional change. You remember how back when I told you that utterances, right, the interactions between characters actually create this, this minuscule moment by moment change that the reader may not necessarily be, be hearing, but they're totaling up in their experience so that after, you know, a bunch of those emotional changes, they're like, man, this has gotten sad. They don't see the steps to the sad, but they feel the totality of the sad. So if you want them to really feel something, you got to spend more time there, right? You got to live in it for a bit. You may have heard me work with authors and say, make a mess and then make the reader sit in it. What we're talking about is making an emotional mess, creating emotional change, and then making the reader sit in that emotional change because the reader isn't going to recognize the moment by moment change. They're going to see the totality of it. So if you have this moment that you want to land on your trampoline like a giant freaking bowling ball that might sag the trampoline so much, it's going to drop it down. If you're writing Beloved by Toni Morrison and you want me to be scared of a ghost that shows up in the middle of Sethi and Paul D's discussion in the kitchen, you got to sit with that ghost. It's not enough to tell me that Paul D and Sethi are scared. It's not enough to have Sethi yell and Paul D go, what is that? You need to make me watch the room shake and Paul D try to grab the table and Paul D yell out to Sethi, are you okay? And Sethi yell back, I don't know. And then both freak out about this ghost for a little bit if you want me as the reader to feel afraid. Or our book club book right now, I was just reading it. Uh, I can't even remember the name of it. Oh no, I'm gonna forget the name of it. Something about uh, she who became the sun. That's it. Opening of the book, right? The emotional tone is this idea of devastation where you encounter this young woman, young girl who has nothing. Her family is starving to death and she is listless. She can barely move. She's got so little energy. She can barely even like go and search for food. The author does a beautiful job of spending three full conversations just to let us know how hopeless things are. 
right? She talks to her father about the inability to find food. First, she's talking to herself. She's just like wandering around in the desert, barren, kind of like looking for food and find nothing. And we're feeling how hungry she is. And then she goes to her father to talk about it. And she's found something and he's upset at how small it is. And then they go to a fortune teller and the fortune teller, uh, the father gives the fortune teller a portion of the food. So the fortune teller can declare that the son her brother is great, but that she is nothing. And you're just living in the devastation of this girl's world for pages and pages and pages. And as I was reading that this week, I started to feel it. I was like, oh, man, this is heavy and this is hard, right? And But that's what the, it's a beautiful start to this amazing story because we start at rock bottom and the emotional journey is a rise, right? Like it's not a straight rise, there's ups and downs, but the emotional journey is a rise. Coming back to where we are, talking about the law of communicating change, you have to spend that kind of time on the page if you really want a reader to invest in the emotional charm they're trying to communicate. You have to spend that kind of time on the page and you have to modulate the character's voice to display that change. The character needs to sound different when uh, Zhu, the lead character, when she is listless and starving, she sounds different than when she has found her place in the monastery and is beginning to grow and learn. Suddenly she has a dry sense of humor that she did not have when she was starting, starving listless. She begins to experience community, right? Like, and in that community, she finds her connection to the other novice monks through this dry sense of humor. And it's, it's fun and it brings hope in the emotional tone because you start to see her uh, grow in this community, right? Like, but the voice was modulated. That's what I'm, that's the point I'm making is that the voice was modulated so that we can feel that emotional tone. The space was given on the page. There are more lines. You will always need more lines to communicate large emotional change than you think you need. And you got to modulate the voice. Now, if you don't want your reader to feel anything and you want your story to just stay in the same course emotional tone, don't give us any word. Don't devote any space on the page to it and don't modulate the character's voice. I will say, if you want a slight emotional change, like maybe you don't want your, care, your reader laughing out loud, but you want them to like grin a little bit, modulate the voice, but don't give a lot of space on the page, right? Because these things are direct are directly connected. How the reader feels the emotional change is uh, proportional to the amount of space you give it on the page and the intensity in which you modulate the character's voice. Okay, last one in our fun holiday uh, dialogue, Dr. <laughs> Nonsense of physics. Uh, last law, the law of the conversation, the con, uh, the law of conservation of mass. Math is, mass is neither created or destroyed in chemical reactions. This was so tough for me to get in chemistry. I didn't understand it for the longest time. I'm not going to explain it now. I would, I would like to call this the Chekhov's gun law. So Chekhov has this great, the Chekhov the playwright has this great uh, thing he said that's often repeated in like a thousand different ways. I don't even know what the exact quote is, but the the basis of it is if there's a gun in act one, somebody better be shot in act two. If there's a gun hanging on the wall in act one, somebody better be shot in act two. The idea here is that you can't have anything extra in your story that is not being used to manipulate the emotional tone. Anything in your story that you're referencing or talking about that doesn't influence the emotional tone must be deleted because it's just noise. You're just putting noise in your story. So for example, I remember when I was a teenager, uh, I got into this like, you know, 
I think it was Renaissance era novel. I can't even tell you what the novel was, but I remember there's like seven, uh, four, it felt like seven, but it was probably only three pages where they were describing the curtains in this palace. And I got so mad at this book because I was like, I better need to know why these curtains are so fancy, right? I didn't, I never need to know. I don't know why they did that to me. And why the author did that to me as a reader. Um, that's a silly example to say, the things that we, that we put in our story that aren't impacting the emotional journey of the reader should be taken out. Um, this is specifically true and where I wanna focus is on your character's personality, your character flaws, right? Just like mass in a chemical reaction, Character flaws do not disappear. If your character is egotistical, or if your character is shy, or if your character is depressed, or if your character uh, is overly confident or super happy, uh, you got to deal with that. You can't just pretend like it doesn't exist. Once you put it in the story, it exists. So in the opening of the story, if your character is shy, if your vehicle character is shy, I'm going to expect that somewhere in Act 2 or Act 3, that character is going to have to be brave. If at the beginning of your story, your character is an egotistical jerk, I'm going to expect somewhere in Act 2 or Act 3 that your vehicle character is going to be forced to sacrifice for the good of others. If your character is sad, I'm going to expect that they're going to have to go on a search for joy. If your character is a lone wolf, I'm gonna expect that they're gonna to have to build community. If your character's super happy, I'm gonna expect that they're gonna to have to face suffering. And if your character is confident, uh, they're gonna to have to be tested, right? Whatever it is that you're setting up at the beginning of the story, it's not gonna go away. You can't just pretend like it's not there. You gotta deal with it. So if you give your character a personality quirk at the beginning of the story, then you need to deal with that personality quirk. Your character needs to transform as we go on this emotional journey. Because when you show us the personality quirk, it's like showing us a gun. You're setting up an expectation. We expect that thing to be fired, right? We expect you to deal with that personality quirk. You gotta deal with it. So as you plan your story, as you're going through these moment by moment things, you're moving moment by moment through the story, be aware of how we as a reader are expecting your characters to change and grow, right? If your character's shy, I know they're gonna have to be brave. Going back to the book that we're currently reading for the Dialogue or Book Club, She Who Became a Son, she, if I'm getting that name wrong, I could hear Tom in Portsmouth, Maine screaming. Uh, <laughs> so going back to that book, the book starts with her being nothing and her having a sense of um, zero self-worth. Now, I, I'm only halfway through, but I can already tell you character growth. Um, that is the growth that we are working with, right? Like we are watching her refuse to accept her fate as nothing. It's a, and it's a beautiful journey, right? Like it's, it's why the book is a great book. It's why we picked it to read is because it's taking us on this amazing emotional journey, watching this character grow through the story. Um, so whatever it is that you set up at the beginning of your story about your character, just know that you have to deal with it. And if you're not gonna deal with that personality flaw or quirk, don't give it to your character's beginning of the story. Don't hang a gun on the wall unless you're gonna shoot it, right? And the same goes with character growth. Okay. These were my uh, tongue-in-cheek seven rules. Let's go through them real quick. Your, your character is on an emotional journey. Uh, the, the emotional tone is what the reader is experiencing and therefore is what the reader is going to judge your story by. Uh, the emotional tone is constantly moving and it is changed by occurrences that you create in the story, whether these are characters interacting with each other or character expectations not being met um, or characters rubbing against one another's expectations, whatever is happening in the story, 
that is changing the emotional tone moment by moment and the reader's experiencing that change in totality. Uh, the change, the rate of the change has magnitude and direction. Not all emotional tone changes are created equal and they do have direction. They are going to be positive or negative. Uh, as your characters interact, not only are they changing the emotional tone, but their relationship with one another should be changing as well. The characters should feel differently about each other as they interact together. Finally, <laughs> not finally, not yet. Uh, that impact on the reader, that change that the emotional tone is experiencing on the reader uh, directly relates to the amount of space you give on the page and how you modulate the character's voices as they experience emotional change. And then finally, if you set up a character flaw at the beginning of the story, know that as you take the reader on this emotional journey, you have to deal with that character flaw toward the end. Okay, thus ended my weird, hopefully fine, hopefully fine uh, conversation about uh, what it is to write, to take the reader on an emotional journey. I hope you enjoyed this. I know this is a little bit shorter episode than usual. I mean, nobody's going to complain about that. Uh, yeah, so um, go sign up for the newsletter. Go get in the community. We'd love to have you. Uh, and get those words on page, right? And if you're going to create an emotional change, give it more space than you think it needs. If you're going to create an emotional change, give it more space on the page than you think it needs. And uh, I will see you again next week. Thanks, y'all.